After preparing the video recorder, she whispered to Frank, Wake him up now. She wanted to give him the chance to vent his anger. No problem, Frank replied, stepping forward to give Marty a hard kick. Marty was instantly awakened from the pain and felt confused. Did someone just kick him? When he opened his eyes and saw Ariana and Frank in front of him, he rounded his eyes in shock. The next second, he jumped out of the bed and looked at them vigilantly. You, how did you get in? What do you want? He demanded. Since Frank appeared here, it was clear that they had aimed to do something bad. Were they going to kill him? What do we want? To do something that should have been done a long time ago, Ariana sneered. Frank was silent for the time being, which were Ariana's instructions to him. Marty immediately figured out that Ariana believed Frank's words and knew that they had exchanged their identities. Perhaps they also suspected that he had something to do with the loss of their files. Laden with a guilty conscience and fear of Ariana, Marty suddenly didn't know what to say. Did you use your connections to delete your high school files? Ariana questioned. Although she asked that question, her tone was confident. She asked simply because she needed Marty to admit it by himself. When Marty heard her question, his expression couldn't hide his guilty conscience, but he pretended to be calm and denied it. What school files? I don't know what you are talking about, he lied. Really? Then why are you panicking? Ariana asked mockingly. Marty was struck dumb for a second and forced himself to calm down, but he failed. I know you're not Frank. You're Marty, revealed Ariana. As soon as she accused him, he hurriedly protested. No, I'm not Marty. I'm Frank. Don't be fooled by Marty. He simply said that to steal my family's properties. His panicked answer further proved his guilty conscience. Frank just looked at Marty angrily, but didn't interrupt. Whether it's true or not, we can easily find out after checking your high school files, Ariana said with a smile. Humph, the school files are lost, Marty replied instinctively, but as soon as he said it aloud, he knew that he had made a mistake. He shouldn't have told her that, but couldn't take his words back. Really, how do you know that the school files are lost? Ariana asked meaningfully. Marty had a guilty conscience for a moment, but soon calmed down. It was Officer Sheffer who told me that. I called him and asked about it. Aren't I allowed to do that? He claimed. Really, Ariana sneered. Marty, don't deny it anymore, because I read your files before reminding Officer Sheffer to check them. I figured out that you're actually Marty, and he's Frank. Marty was shocked. Ariana had already done an investigation before he got the chance to delete the files. She had found out his secret. Before long, he came back to his senses, thinking that it must not be true or that Ariana was bluffing, so he began to deny it again. Miss Young, I don't know why you want to help Marty like this, but I'm the real Frank, he insisted. Ha <laughs> ha, Ariana couldn't help but sneer. She wasn't angry because it wasn't surprising that Marty didn't confess his crime easily. Criminals didn't often confess their crimes, after all, because it was a guaranteed jail sentence. Besides, she was just saying it without presenting evidence. If he didn't try to deny it, no one knew whether he would get away with it by chance. Since I've investigated it, I've collected some evidence, Ariana continued, taking out two files from her backpack, which she threw directly at Marty. Looking at the files that Ariana had thrown on the bed, Marty was trembling with tension, did she really find out the truth? He didn't want to read them because he was afraid of seeing what he didn't want to see. But he had to read them because he also wanted to know if Ariana actually found out the truth. What, don't you dare to read them? Ariana asked sarcastically when she saw that Marty was hesitating. Of course I will. Why should I be afraid? Marty snapped. Challenged by Ariana, he had no choice but to pick the files up. However, his trembling body had already betrayed him. He took the files and hesitated for a moment before daring to open them. When he saw that they were indeed his and Frank's files from high school, he felt terrible and began to lose his confidence. Now, can you still deny it? Ariana challenged. Marty was silent for a few moments, but he raised his voice again upon thinking that the school files had already been deleted. These files you got are fake, he claimed. Well, it seems that you really hold out hope until faced with the grim reality, Ariana sneered, and then she took out another file and threw it to him. This is the file in the Education Bureau system, 
It isn't lost, she revealed. In fact, in order to prevent Officer Sheffer or Marty from playing dirty tricks, Ariana only reminded Officer Sheffer to check the files in their school. She didn't tell him there were files at the Education Bureau as well. After learning that the school files were lost, she asked Kay to check the files in the Education Bureau right away. If the files were still there, that meant Marty didn't know about them, or he didn't have the connections and abilities to delete them. What? Marty gasped. He had no idea that there were archives in the Education Bureau. In that case, he didn't know what he could do now. Suddenly, he thought of something that gave him hope again, so he stared straight at Ariana and admitted, Fine, I'm Marty, but so what? It was Frank's parents who forced me to exchange identities with him. It isn't my fault. Then he looked at Frank and said in a threatening tone, Frank, your attempt to murder me was illegal. Although you didn't succeed, you will be sentenced to years in jail unless I drop the charges. Why don't we end this mess? Out of the goodness of my heart, I won't press charges anymore, so you don't need to be sentenced. Frank was angry when he heard Marty's offer, and he felt it was ironic. Did Marty think what he did wasn't a big deal? Even if it was his parents' fault that they exchanged identities, it wasn't a reason for him to steal his family's wealth and murder his parents. It's not that simple. Since you admit you're Marty, you should return the Stanton family's wealth to Frank, said Ariana. Impossible. I'm still Frank, and the properties of the Stanton family are still mine, insisted Marty. He wouldn't be willing to give tens of millions of dollars worth of properties back to Frank, it was impossible. Whether it's possible or not isn't up to you, but the law, Ariana stated firmly. Although Marty's shamelessness surprised her, she wasn't emotionally affected and stayed calm as always. Do you mean that you don't agree that we can end this matter here? That means Frank is going to go to jail, hissed Marty as he clenched his fists, looked cold, and glared at Ariana. If Frank was the only one who was put in jail, he would naturally be happy to see it done. But the problem was that if it happened, his identity would go public and he would lose the Stanton family's properties. Well, Ariana sneered. Her expression suddenly changed and became cold. She looked at Marty with a menacing look and he felt nervous all of a sudden. He avoided her eyes at once. Afterwards, he heard Ariana's light voice taunting him. Marty, did you forget something? Like the death of Frank's parents? Upon hearing that, Marty panicked and instinctively denied it. No, that had nothing to do with me, he yelled. Did I say it had something to do with you? Why did you yell? Did you panic and feel guilty? Ariana asked ironically. Marty panicked once again. He knew that he lost his composure, so he argued at once. You wronged me, so I got emotional. He kept on denying it because he believed that they had no evidence. Although he had confessed to Frank in the past, he had no proof of it so his confession alone didn't mean anything. I wronged you? Really? Ariana sneered. Then she turned to give a glance at Frank. He understood her signal and opened his mouth. That's what you admitted to me face to face. How are you wronged now? He asked. Hearing Frank talking, Marty rounded his eyes in shock. You can speak? He blurted out. Yeah, sorry to disappoint you, Frank sneered. Marty was indeed disappointed but he still didn't think it would make any difference. So, you said I confessed to you face to face, but what about the evidence? Do you have any? If there is no proof, you are slandering me and I can sue you, he retorted. Even though he spoke confidently, inwardly he was actually very scared, but he couldn't admit it. Frank indeed didn't have evidence, so he was slightly worried. If Marty refused to admit the truth, he might not be able to punish him according to the law. However, Given the current situation, his worries were useless and he could only do his best to make Marty confess. Marty, my parents kindly adopted you. They treated you so well. They fed you and supported you in your studies. Why were you so cruel to them? Frank asked with strong hatred. Marty's dissatisfaction with Frank's parents was immediately exposed. He blurted out, Why do you think they treated me well? They told me to do this and that, and also forced me to exchange identities with you so that you could go to study in a prestigious university, while I could only go to a worse college. Suddenly, Marty realized he shouldn't have said that, so he immediately explained, but that doesn't mean I harmed them. He couldn't admit it. If he did, he would be put in jail. 
Although his reaction was proof that he had a guilty conscience, it would be best if he admitted it outright. Therefore, Frank continued, Yes, it was my parents' fault to ask you to exchange identities with me, but they treated you well. Didn't you retake the SAT and get into a good university afterwards? My parents did ask you to do some housework, but they asked me the same thing. I think that apart from the exchange of identities, there was nothing wrong with my family's treatment of you. You had what I had. We even shared the same amount of allowance. Do you have to hate my parents so much just for a mistake? Did you have to kill them? Frank's mood got angrier and angrier as he questioned Marty. His fists were clenched tightly and his veins protruded. He wanted to beat Marty to a pulp, but he still controlled himself. I didn't. Marty denied it once more. Marty, you killed my parents and you're still sleeping in their room. Aren't you afraid that they'll come to you in the middle of the night? Frank threatened. When Marty heard that, his body trembled a little in fear. Actually, when he first killed Frank's parents, he had nightmares, not only when he slept in their old room, but wherever he slept. After that, in order to be courageous, he slept in their room. At first, he had nightmares every night, but it gradually got better. After a long time, he felt there was nothing to be afraid of. However, now that Frank mentioned it, Marty felt uneasy. He had considered selling this house, but he was still paying off the mortgage for it, so he couldn't get rid of it. Although the Stanton family had some wealth, it would be unrealistic to spend more money to buy a new house. Since he already had a house, why shouldn't he live in it? Therefore, he boldly continued to live there. I didn't kill your parents, Marty whispered. He still denied it, but his willpower was no longer firm because he was reminded of his crime again and again by Frank. He felt even more guilty, so he couldn't bear it now. This was Ariana's strategy to wear Marty down. Therefore, no matter how he denied it, Frank continued to say that it was true. You killed my parents. You confessed it. You told me you cut the brakes of their car. Then you hired a car to hit them. You chose a bad road so that my parents' car failed to stop in the car accident. You knew they had no chance of surviving, Frank taunted. No, 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 Marty protested. His cousin's words were like memories, and they became clearer in Marty's mind, refusing to leave him. It was you. It was you. You killed my parents. You killed them because you wanted to steal my family's properties. You killed my parents, Frank shouted. Every word and every sentence he said made Marty feel more disturbed. In the end, Marty lost control of himself and blurted out, No, they deserved it. Since they forced me to exchange identities with you, why didn't they allow me to inherit your family's wealth? The Stanton family's properties are mine. They belong to me. They wanted to transfer the company to be under your name, so they had to die. You bastard, Frank shouted. He finally couldn't hold himself back, and without delay, he punched his cousin with his full strength until he was beaten to the ground. At this time, Frank was trembling all over in anger as tears rolled down his cheeks. Although he was aware that his parents were killed by Marty, something snapped in him when he heard him confess. Marty was in great pain after being beaten, but he suddenly came back to his senses and realized that he had admitted his guilt. He was shaking with fright. Although he was already doomed, he still tried to deny it. I didn't kill them, but I didn't, he protested. However, it wasn't convincing at all. Come in now, Ariana called, and the door to the room was immediately pushed open. Officer Sheffer and several other policemen walked in. The moment Officer Sheffer saw Marty, he had mixed emotions. He was sad and angry. Before today, they were close friends, and he treated Marty with sincere respect. However, he found out that he was simply being used by him. While he was filled with anger, he felt sad too. Marty was slightly surprised to see the policemen, but he quickly realized that this was part of their plan to get him to confess. They were all in on it. Because Officer Sheffer learned his dirty secret, Marty felt a little embarrassed. It was true he had used Officer Sheffer, but he also viewed him as his friend. Take him away, ordered Officer Sheffer, and two policemen walked to Marty at once. Marty tried to struggle but failed. Ariana put away the video recorder and handed it to Officer Sheffer, leaving the case to him and his colleagues. 
Frank would accompany Officer Sheffer back to the police station. Although they had now proven their identities and cleared up why he had attempted to murder Marty, that didn't mean that he was completely innocent. He had to face the consequences of his attempted act of violence. However, it was understandable why he did it, so the police wouldn't seriously punish him. Before he left, Officer Sheffer thanked Ariana. Thank you so much, Miss Young. Frank thanked her too and had tears of gratitude in his eyes. As long as Marty was punished according to the law, he didn't care what would happen to himself. Officer Sheffer, what will happen to Frank given the situation? Ariana asked. Although she had already helped him a lot, she wanted to know the result. He will still be prosecuted for the attempted assassination of Marty. The sentence for attempted homicide is three to five years in prison. Well, after what has happened today, the court will give a lighter sentence, but he'll still be sentenced to one or two years. If he performs well in prison, he might come out half a year earlier, Officer Sheffer explained. If it's possible, please let Frank use his original identity to deal with his company affairs. Given the situation he's in, he won't be able to manage it any longer, so he can sell it and save the money. He'll need the money after he's out of jail, Ariana pointed out. Don't worry, we will, Miss Young, Officer Sheffer assured her. Thank you, Miss Young, Frank said again. He didn't know what else he could say except to thank her. All right, we should leave now, said Ariana. After that, they separated. However, before Frank left, he found the key to his own house. He not only had to deal with the company's business, but also the house. He planned to keep the house so that he would have a place to live after he came out of jail. He still had to pay thousands of dollars in loans for this house, so he planned to sell his family's company and then repay the mortgage in full before going to jail with peace of mind. After leaving, Ariana and Henry didn't return to the bungalow and instead went to Mountain River Garden. They didn't have much private time to stay together, so now that they had, they naturally wouldn't waste it. Because Gerald would leave with Henry tomorrow, he went back to his family's house that night. The Jordan family was a little unhappy that Gerald had been back in Los Angeles for several days but didn't go home. They supported him in spending more time with his girlfriend, but he at least should go back home once. Even if he just had a meal or stayed there for only one night, they would be happy to see him. If he could come back with his girlfriend, it would be even better. Therefore, at the strong request of his family, he took Amber back to the Jordan family's house. Amber was nervous to meet Gerald's parents. After all, she and him hadn't been together for long, and they were still uncertain about their future together. However, Gerald's family had been asking about her for a while now, so it wasn't polite if she didn't visit them. Amber was normally very outgoing and lively, but she was quite nervous when she met Gerald's family. Luckily, they liked her very much, and they were easy to get along with. Therefore, she soon relaxed. The Jordan family was very worried about Gerald's marriage. Although he was good-looking and had a good family background, it was hard for him to find girls he wanted to date. The problem was that he wanted to find someone he loved. None of the heiresses from families of wealth and power that his family had introduced to him could win his heart. Finally, he met Amber, and she was his dream girl, so his family was happy for them. The Jordan family was much easier to get along with than the Ortiz family because there was no conflict among them. When Amber came, she brought gifts to everyone, and the Jordan family also prepared a beautiful, expensive present for her for their first meeting. It wasn't because they were rich, but because Amber was very important in their eyes. After staying at the Jordan family's house until 9 o'clock p.m., Amber needed to leave. The others wanted her to stay at their house for the night, but she politely refused because she was worried that she would feel uneasy. The Jordan family understood, so they didn't force her to stay. After leaving the house, Gerald looked very upset. What's wrong? Amber asked him. I'm leaving tomorrow. We might be apart for more than two weeks this time, he lamented. He was upset that they would be apart again after being together for only a few days. I know, but that's the way it goes with your job, Amber acknowledged. She was also sad to be apart from him, but she chose him to be her boyfriend, so she had to accept the situation. I don't want to leave you, Gerald said sadly. Amber blushed happily and smiled, but said nothing. Won't you miss me? Gerald asked her. Of course I will, but what can I do about it? 
You still have to go to work, Amber pointed out. Gerald hesitated for a while, then he said carefully, Um, do you want to stay at my place tonight? Once Amber heard that, she flushed and quickly said, I don't think that's a good idea. Although she liked Gerald very much, their relationship was still new, so she wasn't ready to take their relationship to the next level. She believed that he would respect her, but she felt nervous upon thinking of staying with each other for a night. Gerald understood Amber's worries, so he explained right away, Don't worry, without your permission, I won't do anything. I just want to have some private time with you. Gerald meant every word he said. He really loved Amber, so he respected her. He was willing to take things as slow as she wanted. Amber hesitated. She wanted to spend more time with Gerald, too. Seeing Amber hesitating, Gerald stopped persuading her. Well, if you don't want to, I completely understand. I'll drive you back to Aspen Haven right now, he offered. No, Amber blurted out at once. Then do you agree? Gerald asked with satisfaction in his eyes. Amber's face broke out into a big grin. Yes, she agreed. Hearing that, the smile on Gerald's face grew broader and he immediately drove Amber to his place. He had a lot of houses, but he usually stayed in his apartment, which was located in a high-end residential area in the city center, because it was most convenient. Amber was a little nervous when she followed Gerald into his residence. Although she didn't want anything to happen, her heart was pounding excitedly. Gerald's house was decorated very simply because he was a grown man and he rarely came to stay here. Nevertheless, no matter how simple it was, it had all the necessities and they weren't cheap. Therefore, there was elegance in the simplicity. What would you like to drink? Red wine? Coffee? Tea or water? Gerald asked. Coffee, please, Amber said. She actually wanted to have some red wine, but she didn't want Gerald to misunderstand her. Besides, it wasn't the best idea to get drunk, because then something might happen that she didn't want to happen. Aren't you afraid that you won't be able to fall asleep after drinking coffee? Gerald teased her with a smile. It's okay. I'm not sleepy anyway, Amber shrugged. No problem, Gerald acknowledged. Since Amber wanted to drink coffee, he would make her a cup of coffee. He turned on the TV first, then went to make coffee. He then poured a mug of it for Amber, while he poured a glass of red wine for himself. Amber looked at the red wine in Gerald's hand and couldn't help but wonder about it. Would he get drunk? What would he want to do if he was drunk? Thinking of that, she forced herself to snap out of it. She trusted Gerald, and she knew he wouldn't do anything inappropriate to her. Seeing Amber's somewhat absent-minded look, Gerald knew that she was uncomfortable, but he didn't want her to leave because he wanted to spend time with her. However, if she insisted on leaving, he would respect her and drive her home. He sat next to Amber and put his arm around her while holding the wine in his other hand. During the past few days when they were together, they naturally held hands, hugged and kissed each other, but didn't take a further step. Therefore, Amber didn't feel uncomfortable at all being embraced by Gerald. The two of them watched TV and chatted casually. At this time on the TV, a man took a woman home after the couple had gone on a date. After the man walked the woman to her door, he proposed that they sit for a while in the woman's house. The woman hesitated shyly, but agreed in the end. Then they went inside together. The woman asked the man what he wanted to drink, and the man said that a glass of water would be fine. After pouring the water, the two watched TV on the sofa. Seeing that, Amber realized how similar the plot of the TV show was to their night. This plot is very similar to ours, Gerald laughed. This was really a coincidence. Afterwards, on the TV that the man and woman in the show were watching, there were scenes of a man and woman kissing. The couple in the TV series couldn't help but kiss too. Amber and Gerald suddenly were thinking the same thing but Gerald made the first move. He put the red wine on the table, then raised Amber's chin and looked at her. He leaned forward and kissed her. Their movements mirrored the couple on the TV show. It was just a kiss, so Amber didn't push him away. Instead, she enjoyed this feeling very much. However, as time went by, they gradually lost control of themselves. Gerald's hand unconsciously slid under Amber's shirt, then he pressed her on the sofa. Amber was firm about not wanting to take their relationship to the next step tonight, 
so she pushed Gerald away. Gerald got his reason back and felt quite embarrassed. Sorry about that, he said sheepishly, then pulled away. You're just so beautiful, it's hard to control myself, he explained. I'm going to take a break, you stay here and I'll be back. Then, he left the room and headed for the bathroom, where he took a quick, cold shower to calm himself down. After returning to the living room, he looked at Amber with passion in his eyes. It was torture for him to be unable to touch her. Suddenly, Amber looked up at him and gasped. Y you why didn't you put on clothes? She stammered. She saw Gerald's lower body wrapped in a bath towel, with his upper body totally naked, and she couldn't move her eyes away from him. His body was so toned, with a perfect set of abs. Amber ached to touch them. Gerald understood what she was thinking, and he couldn't help but grin. Maybe he would get her to change her mind tonight, after all. Amber's excited look immediately pleased Gerald. He walked up to her in a swagger and asked, How do you like my body? Are you impressed? Yeah, I'm very impressed, Amber replied instinctively. It was her real thought, but she didn't mean to say it out loud, so she turned her eyes away and stopped looking at him at once. The smile on Gerald's face grew broader, and he kept on flirting with her. Why don't you give it a feel, he teased. Stop it, Amber laughed. She knew he was flirting with her, and it was getting hard to resist. Gerald continued to seduce her. Come on, just a touch. It's not a big deal. Don't you like my body? As he said that, he leaned over her on the sofa with a boyish grin on his face. Instinctively, Amber playfully raised her hands to stop him from getting closer. She forgot that his upper body was still naked, so she stretched out her hands and covered his pectoral muscles. In an instant, both of them felt an electric shock. Amber's hands and Gerald's body felt comfortably numb, and then their eyes met, stunned. Their heartbeats also accelerated at the same time. Gerald came back to his senses earlier than Amber, but he didn't interrupt her and just watched her silently. It didn't take long for Amber to get her mind back as well. Her face suddenly flushed, and she immediately withdrew her hands and covered her face. I didn't mean to do that, she admitted sheepishly. Gerald didn't move away, but asked with anticipation. How did it feel? He wanted to know Amber's answer. It felt amazing, she confessed. Gerald's face lit up with a smile, but Amber continued. But I'm not ready to take the next step tonight. Gerald nodded in understanding. He didn't want Amber to think that he was only after one thing, so he stopped flirting with her. After giving her a kiss, he got up from her body and promised, Don't worry, I won't do anything to you before you agree. You have my word. Amber had mixed emotions. She felt both relieved and disappointed when Gerald got up from her body. But ultimately, she was proud of herself for standing her ground. After all, if she and Gerald continued to date, they would have plenty of time to get intimate in the future. The atmosphere became slightly embarrassing, but they soon went back to normal. By this time, it was getting late, so Amber suggested that they go to sleep now. Where is the guest room in your house? She asked. There is no guest room in my house, replied Gerald, raising his eyebrow a little. What? If there isn't a guest room, where should I sleep? On the sofa? Amber questioned, sounding confused. If there wasn't a guest room, why did Gerald bring her back here? In the master bedroom, of course, Gerald said naturally. Amber took a few steps back when she heard that, but before she could say anything, Gerald chuckled and said, Don't worry, I'll sleep on the sofa. Originally, he wanted to sleep with Amber, but it was more important to him that she felt comfortable, so he offered to sleep on the sofa. Amber chuckled too and agreed. Oh, all right. Gerald led her toward the bedroom and took out his pajamas for her. They might be big on you, but that's all I have, he offered. It's okay, Amber replied. She didn't mind it at all, and she actually thought men's pajamas were more comfortable anyway. Gerald also took his own clothes. After glancing at Amber a few times, he went out of the room, but with reluctance. Neither he nor Amber fell asleep that night. Both were thinking about the other. Ariana and Henry, on the other hand, made love passionately for a whole night once more. Early in the morning, after a good breakfast, Gerald took Amber back to Aspen Haven. Ariana went to her university after breakfast. Although she would be late for a class or two, she didn't care. 
After all, she had already been absent from so many classes, and she only needed to make sure that her grades wouldn't drop. Henry didn't drive Ariana there because the distance from Mountain River Garden to UCLA was too far. It would take almost two hours to go back and forth. He needed to go back to the military base right away, so he didn't have time to drop her off. He was reluctant to leave his sweetheart, but they had to be apart for the time being. After Gerald brought Amber back to Aspen Haven, he didn't stay much longer and left as well. He was also reluctant to leave, but he had to do his work. He left to meet up with Henry, and together the two of them went back to the military base. Because Branther had been gone from the world of immortals for many days, Galen sent some of his disciples to find him. Galen knew the reason why Branther had gone to Los Angeles, because he arranged for him to go there. However, after so many days, Branther hadn't brought back any news about smart health medicines, which made Galen suspect that he was too useless and couldn't handle the mortal. Although other immortals that different families sent to investigate smart health medicines didn't have any news either, they didn't directly attack Ariana. Galen, however, told Branther that he could play some tricks. As long as he didn't kill or seriously injure Ariana, it wouldn't be a big deal. However, when the disciples sent by Galen questioned Chuck, they learned that after Branther negotiated with Ariana that day, he disappeared. Chuck didn't take Branther's disappearance seriously because he thought he simply went back to where he came from after failing to settle the deal. They weren't suspicious of Ariana. Although she was quite good at martial arts, she was immortal, so they believed that she was no match for Branther. Chuck also told them that after he left the Shetler group that day, Branther suddenly separated from him and hurried off in a certain direction, as if he was chasing something. After that, the disciples sent by Galen went to investigate further, but they really couldn't find any useful information. After all, they didn't have the ability to check the surveillance cameras along the way. When Ariana parked her car in the UCLA parking lot, she got out of it and came face to face with a tall man who had been waiting for her. It was Ava's older brother from the world of immortals, Ambrose. He had been spying on Ariana for many days and he lost his patience. It was so boring and he got nothing useful, so he had to come out and speak to her personally. When he was spying on Ariana, he didn't forget to pay special attention to the Smart Health Factory, but he found nothing useful there. Ariana knew that many people were spying on her company, so she was prepared and guarded her secrets so that others couldn't find anything useful. Actually, what she was really worried about was that they might damage the medicine factory in order to get the information they were seeking. Luckily, that hadn't happened yet, partly because many different spies from the major families in the world of immortals was spying on her at the same time. Therefore, they were investigating smart health and watching each other, because they were competitors. If any of them dared to cause any damage to Ariana's factory, the others would expose their scheme. Destroying mortals' property was no less serious than harming them, so even if any of them really wanted to cause damage, they didn't dare to do it, although many of them fantasized about it. The security guards that Ariana hired to protect Smart Health were all veterans of the United States Army, and they were much stronger than ordinary people so those who wanted to cause the factory damage wouldn't succeed. There were about 80 veterans recruited by Ariana's security company so far. They were diligent and didn't just sit there and wait for tasks. Instead, they were constantly busy training. Although the training wasn't as hard as their army training, it was still intense. They were master security guards for Ariana's businesses. In fact, not long ago, a competing medicine business attempted to break into the Smart Health factory to steal its secrets. Thanks to her security team, the burglars all failed and were put in jail. The story was shared in the news and instantly spread as a warning to others. Therefore, nobody dared to damage Smart Health again, but it was still held under tight security. When Ariana encountered Ambrose in the UCLA parking lot, she wasn't surprised because she had sensed the air of an immortal earlier on. She also saw him with her jade eyes before she even parked her car. Needless to say, she wasn't happy to see him because he had badly bullied Ava many times before. If it was the right time, she would pay him back for Ava right there and then. She would punish every member of his family if she could. Miss Young, can we have a private talk? Ambrose asked after stopping Ariana. Although he never respected mortals, he needed to be polite 
because he needed to talk about business with her. Who are you? Why should I talk to you? Ariana responded. My name is Mr. Bulbous. Miss Young, can we talk about business? Ambrose requested. I have to go to class. You can talk to the person in charge of my company for business matters, Ariana stated. She wasn't really directing him to talk to someone else, but deliberately pushing him away. In fact, she was the one who was in charge of her company's business matters. Miss Young, I can wait for you to finish your classes. How about that? Ambrose proposed. As long as Ariana agreed to talk, he didn't care if he had to wait for her for a while. Okay, but I don't have time until this evening. I'm going to invite my classmates to share dinner tonight. We can book a table in the same restaurant. I'll have a talk with you, then eat with my friends, Ariana told him. In fact, it was a lie that she didn't have time until the evening. She deceived Ambrose simply to keep him waiting for her for a longer time. Actually, she didn't even plan on meeting him that evening at all. No problem, Ambrose replied quickly. Miss Young, can I have your number so I can contact you? He requested. Ariana didn't refuse and gave him her business card. After that, she walked to her classes. Ambrose understood that although she agreed to talk with him, it didn't mean she would cooperate with him. He didn't tell her what business he was going to talk about with her yet, and he also clearly knew she had no plan to work with anyone on her medicine business. Therefore, he was clearly aware that she would turn him down. Even though he knew he would be rejected, he still decided to have that talk because he had other purposes. He wanted to meet with her in order to use violence to force her to agree. The reason he dared to come to see Ariana today was because he knew Caspian and Finian weren't around today. If they were, they would definitely stop him from being able to meet with her. Once Ambrose left, he went back to his hotel to rest. He would go to see Ariana again in the evening. When Ariana got to the economics building, it was 10 minutes before the end of the second class, so she didn't go in right away. Instead, she found a place downstairs to sit and wait for the class to be over and go inside then. When the morning classes were over at noon, Ariana met up with Evelyn, Kat, and Candace at the university cafeteria. While they were standing in line, she invited them to go to a restaurant for dinner with her later that evening. There was no special occasion, she just wanted to invite them to have a meal together. She didn't lack money, so her friends wouldn't hesitate to let her treat them to dinner. When they got their lunch and started eating, Danny and another boy walked in and saw Ariana, as well as the other girls, so he immediately ran over to their table. After what had happened between him and Reeve, the Dubinowski family stopped helping the Butler family, making them lose many business deals. Reeve's parents had gone to Benjamin to beg him to reconsider, but Benjamin refused to help them again. He also honestly told them that it was already very kind of him that he didn't harm them further. It was impossible for him to help them again. They had tried to kill his son, so he definitely wouldn't give them a second chance. If they weren't relatives, he might have punished them more seriously. The boy with Danny was his best friend and roommate, Tyler Tibbins. Tyler was a little shy, so he felt slightly timid in front of Ariana because she wasn't only a pretty girl, she was also the chairman of a large business group and a very important figure. Danny couldn't relax either, and although he had already met Ariana several times, he was still nervous around her. After Danny and Tyler greeted Ariana and the others, Ariana invited them to share the table with them after they went to get their food. Because they needed to pay before eating in their cafeteria, Ariana and the others had already bought their lunches, or Danny would have offered to pay for them too. From a short distance, several of Danny's roommates saw him dining with Ariana. They were surprised and envious of him. How does Danny know Ariana? One of them asked, sounding jealous. I don't know, but I've seen him talking with her before, another roommate replied. Are they relatives? wondered the first boy. Who knows? shrugged his friend. Other people heard the discussion and started whispering as well. One student rolled his eyes and stated, it's none of their business that the boy knows Ariana. Why are they so jealous? They're green with envy. They just wish they were friends with her so they could feel important too, theorized another student. Ariana didn't care about their discussions about her. They weren't important after all. However, there was a hateful look focused on her that she really couldn't ignore. So she turned to look at the person who was glaring in her direction. It was Pam Harper. Pam didn't know that what had happened to her father had something to do with Ariana, but there was a long-standing grudge between them, 
so she never liked her. Pam no longer hung out with Chantel and Mona. She was all alone. Although Roland was arrested, the Harper family was still wealthy, but was hardly comparable to the old days. They were more of an average rich family after being a second-rate, extremely wealthy family. The terrible news hit the Harper family badly. Donovan lacked the ability to manage the family's company well, so he was deprived of the seat after only a few days. Roland's younger brother, Keenan, was the chairman now. Keenan was always ambitious, and he had a lot of talent in business, so he soon stabilized the situation after taking over the position. He stopped the Harper family from losing more wealth. It was also because Ariana didn't punish the Harper family very severely. The whole family wasn't her target. She only taught the person who made the mistake an unforgettable lesson. Speaking of that, Donovan had caused Ariana trouble too, and she hadn't paid him back yet. She actually gave it up because she would have done it earlier on if she was still angry about it. When Pam saw Ariana looking over at her, she immediately lowered her head to eat her food. She hated Ariana, but she was very afraid of her. However, when Ariana saw Pam's face, she was surprised and concerned because Pam was entangled with some black menacing aura. Obviously, she was affected by something unclean, but Ariana didn't know whether it was an unlucky object or a ghost. Whatever it was, from the looks of it, she would be in trouble sooner or later. Ariana didn't care about Pam's life, but she wanted to know what affected her and whether it would harm other people. Therefore, she decided to investigate it, but not now. She would do it at night. When Ariana looked over, Evelyn followed her gaze and saw the black aura entangled in Pam's body. She frowned and looked at Ariana. Ariana just glanced at her and continued to eat. This wasn't the time to talk about it. Evelyn understood, so she didn't ask right away, but waited until they separated before sending Ariana a private message on WeChat. Ariana directly told her her thoughts and explained that she would follow Pam in the evening. Evelyn said she wanted to go too, but Ariana rejected it. She could handle it alone, and she would contact Evelyn if she needed her help. Since Ariana said no, Evelyn didn't insist. After their classes were over in the afternoon, Ariana left with her friends to go to dinner. Ambrose waited outside the UCLA entrance gates and seemed displeased once he saw Ariana coming out with Evelyn. He knew that Ariana would be going to dinner with her schoolmates, but he was surprised to see Evelyn. Did she bring her along on purpose? He wondered that momentarily, but he didn't think it could be true because Ariana was only immortal. She couldn't know that he was an immortal and Evelyn wouldn't expose her background either. There was a rule in the world of immortals that they were forbidden to show their background to mortals. However, because Evelyn was with Ariana, he couldn't talk about the business deal with her now. Ambrose clenched his teeth in frustration. Now, his only choice was to call Ariana and tell her that he had to leave because something just came up. He would meet her another day. When Ariana heard his excuse, she smugly agreed to postpone their meeting. In fact, she brought Evelyn with her on purpose to waste Ambrose's efforts. She didn't want him to be able to talk with her so easily. Although Ambrose had Ariana's number, he couldn't talk about everything with her on the phone. He had to see her face to face in order to threaten or abduct her. Ariana enjoyed dinner with her friends. Then they headed back to campus for their evening classes. When there were only five minutes left before her class ended, Ariana left the classroom and walked to the building where Pam had classes. She found an unobtrusive place and waited for Pam to walk out. After waiting for a while, students came out one after another. Ariana didn't see Pam until all the students were gone. She was the last to walk out. She walked with her head lowered, seeming very gloomy, and no one around dared to approach her. Pam didn't go back to her dormitory, but walked towards the lake instead. There was a natural lake on the UCLA campus that was about 200 yards in length. There were forest trails on both sides of the lake, and students went there to take walks in their free time, but now the weather was colder, so there were a lot fewer people. Pam walked to the depths of the forest trail. The deeper she went, the fewer people there were. No one ever walked to the end of the forest trail because there were rumors that someone died there a few years ago, and the area gave people the creeps. Ariana had heard of the area's history, but she didn't think it was strange that someone had died there. That didn't mean it was haunted. Nevertheless, 
This area of campus was far from her dorm or the building where she had classes. She seldom was on campus and hadn't explored everywhere, so she had never been here before. Although few people dared to go to this area, Pam didn't seem to be afraid because she kept walking deeper into the wooded area. At this point, Ariana had a theory about what was going on. However, she just guessed and couldn't make a judgment yet. Pam didn't notice someone was following her because Ariana was very good at being sneaky. After all, she was an immortal, so it would be a bit pathetic if she couldn't easily follow a mortal without exposing herself. Ariana kept a distance away from Pam, but always kept her in her sight. Pam almost walked to the end of the trail, then stopped and looked around for a while. Ariana quickly ducked behind some bushes. After making sure that there was no one around, Pam shouted towards the lake, Come out now. For a split second, Ariana thought that Pam had just discovered her, but she was confident that she was hiding well. A few seconds after Pam called out, the water on the lake rippled. Upon seeing that, Ariana narrowed her eyes. It was obvious that Pam was shouting at something in the water. However, what was it? Was it a monster or the ghost of the person who supposedly died here? Ariana didn't use her jade eyes to see what it was right away, but instead waited with patience, knowing that it would reveal itself soon. At this moment, she was very sure that the black aura entangled in Pam's body was related to the thing in the water. Before long, something dark appeared on the surface of the lake. It was a head. After that, a pale face appeared over the water. As Pam watched the scene, she couldn't help but step back a few times in fright. Her face became a little pale, and her body was trembling with nervousness too. Even though this wasn't the first time she had seen it, she still couldn't help feeling scared. Before long, a pale-faced girl stood on the water. She had long hair that fell to her waist and wore a long white dress. She was obviously a water ghost. Ariana had seen countless ghosts before, so she didn't feel phased at all. According to rumors, the student who died here was also a girl. It seemed this ghost was the rumored girl. Normally, ordinary people couldn't see ghosts, but Pam's ability to see it was related to the trauma she had been through recently. Because she had been consumed with strong hatred lately and her whole body was very weak, it was easy for her to see things that shouldn't be seen. After the ghost showed itself, it didn't notice Ariana. Instead, it floated directly to Pam. Although Pam was nervous and scared, she didn't back down anymore. After the ghost came to her, Pam took out a knife from her backpack, then slightly cut her finger and stretched it towards the water ghost. The ghost stretched out its hand, and three drops of blood from Pam's hand dripped onto its translucent hand. Witnessing that scene, Ariana realized that Pam was nourishing the ghost. For a human to nourish a ghost, three drops of blood needed to be dropped on the ghost every day. That was what Pam was doing to the ghost in the lake. After 49 days, the ghost would possess Pam's body and share her body with her. That would mean that Pam would also have the abilities of the water ghost. However, after a person and a ghost were combined, they could only live for 49 days. Thus, the ghost didn't care about losing its soul, while Pam didn't care about losing her life. They must be aiming to get revenge on people who they had bitter grudges against. It's been 15 days. There are still 34 days to go. Once it's done, you can deal with the person you want to deal with, and I can take revenge too. All right, you can leave now, the ghost ordered gloomily. Her cold eyes were filled with ruthlessness and anticipation. All right, Pam replied in a low voice, then turned and left. When she left, she took out a band-aid from her bag and applied it to her finger. After Pam was gone, the ghost sank back into the lake. Ariana didn't move until Pam walked far away. Then she stepped forward and stood at the place where Pam stood earlier. She first looked into the water with the help of her jade eyes and saw the water ghost sitting under it. Then she took a few small stones from the ground and threw them into the lake. The fall of the stones attracted the attention of the ghost. It raised its head and looked towards the water's surface, then saw Ariana's figure on the shore. She was a bold girl because she dared to come here alone at night. Although Ariana happened to throw rocks at the lake's surface above the ghost, the ghost didn't know that Ariana came for it. 
It thought that she was a student in a bad mood who came here to vent her anger. The ghost understood that ordinary people couldn't see it, but it wanted to go out since someone dared to come here. Perhaps it could scare the student. Therefore, it immediately surfaced. When the ghost came out, the surface of the water rippled, but the waves weren't large, and the wind at night was already strong, so the lake surface was already disrupted. Even if someone noticed the ripples, it wouldn't attract much attention. Nobody would relate it to ghosts. After the ghost came out, there was a gloomy wind around her, which was terrifyingly creepy. The ghost glared at Ariana, which would normally give people the strange feeling that they weren't alone, causing them to get scared and run away. However, Ariana only looked at the ghost calmly, and her face didn't change at all. The ghost could feel that Ariana's sight was focused on its body, which surprised it. Could Ariana see it? However, why didn't she look horrified? Or maybe she couldn't see it, and it was just a coincidence that she was staring in that direction. No matter what it was, the ghost was determined to figure it out. Without delay, it floated towards Ariana, who remained calm as usual. Don't look so confused. I'm looking at you, affirmed Ariana calmly. Hearing that, the ghost was terrified and floated back six feet at once. Afterwards, it fiercely stared at Ariana and demanded, Who are you? How could you see me? Why are you not afraid of me at all? I can see you, and I'm not afraid of you, so I'm obviously not ordinary, replied Ariana. Then she asked, Are you the girl who was rumored to have died here in UCLA? Sue Winchester? That was the name of the girl who died in this lake three years ago. Ha ha ha, you are wrong. I'm not the girl who died three years ago. I died four years ago, so I'm not Sue. My name is... The ghost stopped immediately as it was about to say its name because it didn't want to reveal it aloud. Ariana had been sure that the ghost was Sue Winchester, so now she felt embarrassed hearing the ghost's answer. The ghost said it died four years ago, which meant there were a few people who died in this lake. What's your name then? Ariana asked. Why should I tell you? The ghost asked her instead. Well, I can find it out by myself if you refuse to tell, shrugged Ariana. Ridiculous, the ghost sneered with a cackle. I'm not a student of UCLA, and no one knew that I died here. Even my body is at the bottom of the lake and has turned into bones now. Do you really think you can find out my identity? Ariana slightly frowned. If that was true, she naturally couldn't figure it out. Whatever, I don't have to know who you are, but you can't stay in the mortal's world because you're a ghost. I can't let you harm mortals, stated Ariana. Hearing that, the ghost looked mad and showed a strong desire to kill. Do you want to get rid of me? Why? It hissed. Because Ariana could see it and wasn't afraid of it, that meant she wasn't an ordinary mortal. The ghost felt a little worried because she must really have the ability to destroy ghosts. Because you shouldn't stay in this world and harm people, said Ariana, thinking of the ghost deal with Pam. Although the ghost and Pam agreed to have the deal, it was very harmful. You don't have the power to judge me or decide whether I should stay in this world. And that girl is willing to do it, the ghost retorted. That was true, but Ariana couldn't let it go. As an immortal, it was her responsibility to remove ghosts and harmful monsters from this world, because they would only hurt mortals. If that's what you think, you can try to defeat me if you can. Or you can try to run away, challenged Ariana. Great, let me see what you can do, the ghost snarled and then it attacked her the next second. The ghost chose to fight against Ariana rather than run away because it knew Ariana would be able to catch it if it failed in the fight against her. Therefore, it would rather try fighting first to see who could win. To be honest, the ghost didn't have much confidence, so it didn't dare to take Ariana lightly. It opened its arms and used its magic power to condense the water on the lake into dense drops of water. They floated up and moved towards Ariana. These water droplets weren't common water droplets. They were water droplets filled with magic power. Each droplet was like a sharp blade. Once it hit somebody, it could penetrate the bones. If there were ordinary people around, they couldn't see the scene because they weren't in the same magnetic field as the ghost. Therefore, these deadly water drops could only target people who could see the ghost because people who could see it were in the same magnetic field as it. 
Ariana immediately used her magical energy to create a barrier to stop the water droplets that the ghost shot towards her. When the droplets touched the barrier, they turned into a pool of water and fell to the ground. Although the ghost understood that Ariana wasn't an ordinary person, it was still shocked after witnessing her easily defend herself against its attack. However, the ghost definitely wouldn't retreat after a single failure. It condensed drops of water again and attacked Ariana once more. After several failed attempts, the ghost gave up the water droplets and fought against her in close combat. Once they were in a fight, the ghost realized that there was a huge gap between their abilities. It kept retreating against the strength of Ariana's powers, and it even had the idea of running away. But it wasn't easy to run away from Ariana. Every time it tried to hide in the water, Ariana would anticipate its movements and stop it. Although the ghost could float on the water, Ariana could also use magical energy to form a barrier under her feet and then step on the surface of the lake. She was an immortal after all. However, just when the ghost was anxious about how to escape, they heard the sound of approaching footsteps. That meant Ariana couldn't continue to fight with the ghost. If other people saw her standing on the water, it would cause trouble. Because Ariana and the ghost had moved a little apart, she couldn't get it into her telepathic eye space immediately, and the ghost dived into the water when Ariana stopped to listen to the footsteps. Ariana was frustrated, but it wasn't a big deal. The ghost couldn't leave the lake anyway, so it would be easy for her to find it again. She went back to the ground at once and hid herself in an unobtrusive place. She wanted to leave right away, but she didn't want to be seen by others, so she stayed and would leave after the people were gone. The footsteps she heard belonged to a man and a woman. The man was older, probably in his late 30s. He must be a teacher. The woman, on the other hand, was in her early 20s. She seemed to be a student. Why did this male teacher and female student come here so late at night? Were they doing some shameful things? Ariana wondered. The two stopped not far from where Ariana was hiding. The girl was holding the man's hand, and with a nervous and worried expression, she said, Jay, what should I do? I've aborted two babies, and I don't want to do it anymore. The doctor said that if I have an abortion again, I'll completely lose my ability to be a mother in the future. In the darkness, the man showed impatience, but his voice was gentle and comforting. Monica, I know that abortions hurt your body a lot. This time, I won't let you do it again but I can't leave my wife to be with you for the time being. I'm about to be promoted to the deputy dean. If the news spreads that I've been having an affair with a student, I'll lose the job. How about this? You can drop out of college and take good care of the baby. Once my career is established, I'll figure out a reason to divorce my wife and then marry you. What do you think? Although Jay made that offer, it was a complete lie, but Monica didn't know it. She only felt confused. How long will it take? She asked. The promotion to deputy dean will take more than six months to complete, at least, and I can't get divorced as soon as I get promoted. That will reflect poorly on me. Therefore, I need two years before I can get a divorce, Jay explained. The truth was, he had no plans to leave his wife for Monica. As for the baby, he didn't want it either. He was just comforting her for now, then would think of a way to get rid of the baby in her belly. Although the baby was his, he already had children, and Monica was just one of his mistresses, so this baby shouldn't exist. Accordingly, Jay didn't think it was wrong to kill it before it was born. After all, Monica had already had two abortions for him. What? Two years? No way. I can't wait that long. The baby will be born by then. How am I supposed to raise a child by myself? Monica cried out. Because she lost control of herself, she raised her voice. Keep your voice down. Do you want other people to hear us? Jay snapped at her angrily. Monica realized her voice was too loud, so she covered her mouth at once. She didn't want other people to hear them either, so she apologized quietly. I'm sorry, I didn't do that on purpose. But Jay, I can't wait that long, she repeated. Jay felt irritated because Monica was unwilling to obey his words. Do you want me to be promoted to deputy dean or not? He asked. Of course I do, but I just... Monica's voice trailed off. She didn't know what to say all of a sudden. 
Monica, just wait for me for two years. I promise I'll marry you then, Jay said in an attempt to comfort her. Monica was quiet for a few moments. Finally, she couldn't help but ask, Can't you give up the position of Deputy Dean for me and for our baby? Jay got angry once he heard that. Impossible, he scoffed. For her? For the baby? Who did she think she was? She was just a mistress. It was impossible for her to become his wife. His current wife's family was powerful and influential, and his opportunities were all dependent on his relationship with them. He wasn't stupid. He would never divorce his wife. If he divorced, he would have to give up his future. Unfortunately, he despised his wife, who was a strong-willed woman. He felt that he didn't have much influence at home, so he sought balance by keeping women as his mistresses. Do you know how hard I've worked for this position? Right now is a critical moment. How can I give it up? Jay argued angrily. I just don't want to wait, and I can't afford the time. I hope that when the baby is born, there will be a father who can help raise it, Monica begged. Seeing that Monica refused to leave him, Jay became a little cruel and had a certain vicious thought, but he soon hid it. Fine, I promise you that I'll take care of these things before the baby is born. Right now, all you need to do is take care of the baby. I'll give you $20,000 later. Buy whatever you want, all right? He snapped. Do you mean it? Monica asked doubtfully. She wasn't convinced by him. Yes, I mean it, Jay stated. He put on a sincere look, and Monica temporarily believed him. All right, I trust you, she replied. After that, they left together. After Jay and Monica left, Ariana walked out of the dark, holding a phone in her hand. She had recorded the conversation she just heard. It wasn't that she was nosy, but she had a premonition that something bad might happen later. It seemed to her that both Monica and Jay were terrible people. Monica had intervened in another woman's family, which wasn't right. However, it took two to tango, and this man named Jay seemed even more sleazy than her. Jay clearly had a family, but he still went to hook up with a female student, which was completely inappropriate. Moreover, as a teacher at UCLA, it was against others' expectations that he did such a morally corrupt thing. Given Jay's reaction just now, Ariana suspected he might attack Monica to preserve his own future. She just wasn't sure whether he would only attack the baby in Monica's belly or Monica as well. If he decided to harm Monica, would he injure or kill her? Ariana wouldn't interfere if Jay did nothing, but if the situation became serious and he tried to hurt Monica, she wouldn't be able to sit on the sidelines. Shortly after Jay and Monica left, Ariana also walked out of the wooded area. It was after 10.30 p.m., and it wouldn't be good if she returned to the dormitory too late. Therefore, she would deal with the ghost later. Anyway, Pam was fine for the time being. The ghost in the water also heard the conversation between Jay and Monica, which caused her to get emotional right away. The scene was so familiar. Like Monica, the ghost had been fooled by a man, and that man eventually killed her to preserve his future. Now, the ghost ached to kill that man for revenge. Thanks to Pam, there was finally a chance. But unexpectedly, Ariana appeared and threw a wrench in the plan. The ghost knew that Ariana wouldn't give up, so they would soon meet again. Next time, it would be ready. When Ariana returned to the dormitory, it was nearly 11 o'clock p.m. Because she told her roommates that she needed to deal with something and that she would come back late in the evening, Kat and Candace didn't ask her any questions when she was back. Evelyn knew where Ariana went. Although she wanted to know whether she had found out anything about Pam, it obviously wasn't the right time to ask about that. Therefore, she could only message Ariana on WeChat when they were about to sleep. She messaged her, Ariana, did you find anything useful? Because it was Evelyn, Ariana didn't bother to keep it a secret from her. She replied, Pam is nourishing a ghost that lives in the lake near the end of the trail. She drips three drops of blood on the ghost every day. After 49 days, it will be able to possess Pam. Evelyn was shocked when she read that. It was beyond her expectations. She quickly messaged back, What's Pam's purpose? Ariana responded, I have no idea for now, but I think she might have a plan to get revenge on me. She had that suspicion because Pam hated her very much. Evelyn sent back a message that said, 
If so, it'll be a total waste of her effort. Pam is no match for you, so she's doomed to fail. Anyway, the ghost must also want to take revenge by doing that. Ariana replied, It has to work quickly, because it can only live 49 days after it succeeds. What's your plan then? Evelyn messaged. Ghosts aren't allowed to stay in the mortal world. Since I encountered it, I should remove it from our world. My plan is to eliminate its obsession first, and let it fall into reincarnation by itself. Ariana responded. Evelyn replied, Sounds like a great plan. I know you can deal with it, but feel free to let me know if you need me. Evelyn really wanted to help, but only if Ariana needed her. Ariana assured her, I will. Their chat ended there. The next day at noon, right after their morning classes were over, Ariana received a call from Ambrose. He asked her whether she was free. If she was, he hoped they could have a private talk. Even though Ariana was going to talk about business with Ambrose eventually, she wouldn't let him succeed easily, so she replied that she was busy. Ambrose asked her whether she was free in the evening, but Ariana turned him down once more. Ambrose was a little mad and began to suspect that she didn't want to see him. However, no matter how displeased he was right now, he couldn't argue with her, so he asked her when she was available. Ariana said that she would see him tomorrow, and she would try to squeeze in some time to see him. Since she said that, Ambrose could only wait. When Ariana and her roommates were having lunch in the cafeteria, Ariana kept looking around every so often during the meal. Ariana, who are you looking for? Kat asked curiously. Oh, nothing. I'm just casually looking around, shrugged Ariana. Kat nodded and stopped asking further about it. Evelyn, however, knew that she was looking for Pam. Halfway through the meal, Ariana finally spotted Pam in the corner. She still had that gloomy expression, but this time, she didn't see Ariana. After eating, Ariana and her friends went for a walk around campus. At this time, Ariana's phone rang, and it was Henry. She told her roommates that she needed to answer the call and walked aside. Once she walked away, her friends began to discuss it. Do you think it's her fiancé calling? Oh, I feel a little envious of her, lamented Kat. Don't be jealous. Get yourself a boyfriend, retorted Candace. It's not that easy. Besides, when I do get a boyfriend, it won't be one of our schoolmates. They're just boys. I like mature men, announced Kat. Do you think you are mature yourself? Teased Candace. So what if I'm not? I still want a mature and stable man, said Kat with determination. Candace shook her head and argued. Mature men don't want to date immature girls because they want girlfriends instead of daughters. They prefer mature, elegant women. Take Ariana as an example. She's young, but she behaves much more maturely than people in their 30s. Stop upsetting me, Kat whined. I can't. It's so enjoyable, laughed Candace. Candace, what did you say? Kat asked and began to playfully chase and fight with Candace. Meanwhile, Ariana was talking with Henry on the phone. How are you, sweetheart? Henry asked. I'm fine. How about you? Ariana asked. I'm fine too, said Henry. Then he hesitated before asking. Are you sure that you're fine? Did something strange happen to you? Ariana admitted. Yeah, I noticed something wrong at UCLA. She didn't bother to keep it a secret from Henry, so she told him what she had witnessed yesterday with the water ghost. She didn't tell him about her meeting with Ambrose because she didn't want to worry him. After all, the matter with Ambrose was very complicated. I know you're very strong, but you must be careful when you're dealing with that ghost. No matter what you encounter, protect yourself well. If you need any help, turn to my mother and Ezekiel, instructed Henry. Although he trusted Ariana, he was still worried about her safety. Yeah, I know. You should be careful too. No matter what you run into, protect yourself first, Ariana reminded Henry with concern. She knew he carried out his tasks with his close comrades, and she might seem a little selfish by saying that. Of course, she wouldn't stop Henry from stepping forward when his comrades were in danger, but it was on the condition that he was able to succeed. If he had to exchange other people's lives with his own, Ariana couldn't accept it. However, danger was always unpredictable, and sometimes reality went the opposite of what you thought. In order to not worry Ariana, Henry promised her, I'll be careful. They chatted for a while, then hung up. When Ariana came back to Kat and the others, they joked about the call with her. Oh, look at you, girl in love. Tell us, was it your boyfriend? Kat teased, making a face at Ariana. 
What boyfriend? It was her fiancé. A fiancé is different from a boyfriend. Of course, you have neither, so you must know nothing about it, Candace corrected. Once Kat heard that, she squinted and looked dangerous. Staring at Candace, she clenched her teeth and said, You're determined to argue against me, aren't you? Candace immediately ran behind Ariana, seeking protection. She was afraid Kat would hurt her because she had scratched her just now and it itched very uncomfortably. Kat was an expert at martial arts and Candace was no match for her. Even though Candace was scared of Kat, she still retorted in annoyance. I didn't argue against you. I was telling the truth. Come on, don't hide then. Get out now, we need to talk. Kat coaxed meaningfully, looking at Candace with a faint smile. Candace squealed and immediately appealed to Ariana for help. Ariana, you have to help me. Kat always bullies me because she's much stronger than me, she complained. Haha, you beg for help when you can't win. It's what cowards do, Kat laughed. You're bullying me just because you're stronger than me. Why don't you have a fight with Ariana, Candace argued. Kat was struck dumb for a second and didn't know what to say. Evelyn and Ariana said nothing during this whole exchange. They just stood aside and watched the drama, feeling amused. Unfortunately, their lunch break was over, and it was time to go to their afternoon classes, so they separated. As Ariana walked to her next class, she saw Jay walking past her. Because she didn't really know him, she didn't bother to greet him. Jay, however, recognized her and greeted her of his own accord. Hi, you must be Ariana Young, right? I've heard so much about you. I'm Professor Jay Winters. Since he greeted her, she couldn't forget her manners. She responded, Yeah, I am. Hi, it's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Ariana. You're really the pride of UCLA. You're so successful, even at your young age. Keep on fighting, Jay encouraged. He truly respected Ariana, so he wasn't lying. Thanks, I will, said Ariana. Well, you better head to your class now, Jay instructed. He didn't waste any more of her time because he didn't want to annoy her. Sure, bye-bye, replied Ariana. Then she walked away. If she didn't know Jay's dirty secret, she might have had a good impression of him, but she happened to know the truth, so she felt disgusted. If he hadn't done anything bad, she wouldn't do anything to him, but she couldn't stay on the sidelines and let him get away with unacceptable things. Ariana hated bad people, especially when they got away with their crimes. After the evening class was over that night, Pam went to the lake again. However, Ariana got there first. Because she didn't intend to reveal her identity, she changed her clothes and wore a baseball cap and mask. When Ariana arrived, the ghost saw her. Even though she was wearing a mask, the ghost could still see that she was the same girl who came last night, which was very frustrating. The ghost couldn't appear if Ariana was watching. If it couldn't appear, it wouldn't be able to get Pam's blood. If it stopped doing that for a single day, its whole plan would be aborted. Therefore, the ghost was very angry with Ariana, but it didn't dare to confront her head on because it was no match for her. When Pam got there, she suddenly saw someone standing in the clearing and she was startled. Although Pam didn't know who she was, she could tell that she was a young woman. She must be a very brave person since she dared to come here late at night. Anyway, since there was someone else there, she naturally couldn't give her blood to the ghost. So she started to turn around and leave. She would come back when the person left. Just as Pam turned around, Ariana opened her mouth, and her voice naturally changed to the voice that she used when she pretended to be Amelia. Wait a second, she called out. Pam suddenly stopped and looked back at Ariana. Then she asked a little nervously, D Did you just call me? I heard that a girl died here before, and many people don't even dare to come to this area. Why do you come here alone? Are you not afraid at all? Ariana asked. A guilty conscience flashed on Pam's face, and she retorted, You're a girl too, and you also came here. Why are you not afraid? I'm bold, shrugged Ariana. I'm also bold, insisted Pam, but she didn't have much confidence. Even though she had made a deal with the ghost, she was still very scared when she came here by herself every night. Really, but I can see that you're scared, Ariana taunted. It's none of your business, Pam snapped angrily. She thought that Ariana was unreasonable by continuing to question her. Well, I don't need you to be honest with me, because I know why you came here, Ariana revealed with a sneer. You know? Pam gasped. She panicked at first, but refused to believe it the next second. She felt Ariana was just tricking her. 
She composed herself and challenged. If you know, then tell me what I am doing here. You came to see a ghost, Ariana replied, with a very calm tone, and she showed no fear at all when she talked about ghosts. What? Pam blurted out, shocked. Ariana rolled her eyes. All right, no need to beat around the bush. Pam, I really want to know why you made the deal with that ghost to give it your blood for 49 days, then let it possess you. I know you won't tell me, so I won't ask, but is it really worth it? You can only live a month or two in exchange for your revenge, she pointed out. When Pam heard Ariana's words, she was completely dumbfounded that she knew about her plan with the ghost. I, I you, she stuttered. She wanted to say something, but didn't know what to say. She felt that more and more things were beyond her understanding now. Although she knew about the existence of ghosts, she hadn't completely digested it yet. The ghost still made her scared and frustrated. If she wasn't so desperate to deal with her enemies, she wouldn't dare to strike a deal with this ghost. She thought that no one else knew about the existence of ghosts, but this woman standing in front of her somehow knew. Who was she? How did she know it? After Pam recovered from the shock, she realized that something was wrong. This woman just said that after the ghost possessed her, she could only live for one or two months, but that wasn't what the ghost told her. You're wrong. The ghost clearly said that it won't hurt me. It just wants to use my body to take revenge. After that, it'll leave my body, Pam contradicted, although she wasn't feeling very confident that the ghost had told the truth. This woman in front of her, on the other hand, knew everything, so Pam felt this woman might be right. Well, why do you trust the ghost so much? Ariana mocked sarcastically when she heard Pam's reply. I, Pam stuttered. Her mind was in a mess now, and she didn't know who to believe. She wanted to retaliate against her enemies, so she wanted to gain the ghost's help, but she wasn't willing to give up her life for revenge. She realized she didn't want to die yet when she heard Ariana say it out loud. She felt foolish. No matter who you believe, your deal with the ghost can't continue because I'm going to destroy it, Ariana declared. She planned to pay no more attention to Pam. No, Pam instinctively shouted. If this woman killed the ghost, then she won't be able to take revenge. Ariana looked at Pam with a chuckle, then asked gloomily, What, do you want to die? No, Pam immediately admitted. I, I just want revenge. I don't want to die. Ariana squinted and asked, Who's your enemy? She had a feeling it was her. I, I, Pam stammered but didn't say anything aloud. If you tell me, perhaps I can help you, claimed Ariana, although she had no plans of helping Pam. She simply wanted to figure out whether she was her target. Why should I trust you? Pam snapped. She and this woman didn't know each other, so she definitely wouldn't trust her easily. What if the woman went back on her word? Believe it or not, I don't have time to talk nonsense with you, Ariana replied coldly. She didn't want to waste more time on Pam, so she flashed over to her in an instant. Before Pam could react, Ariana knocked her unconscious and she sank to the ground. She couldn't let Pam know what would happen between her and the ghost. After Pam fainted, Ariana looked towards the lake and said coldly, Are you coming out on your own and we can talk about it? Or do you want me to do it myself? As soon as Ariana finished, the ghost's chilling voice came from the lake. Talk? Humph, why should I believe that you just want to talk with me? No matter how you try to hide, you won't be able to escape from me, Ariana threatened arrogantly. But it was true. She had more skills and abilities than the ghost did. The ghost was instantly furious, but it was also aware that Ariana told the truth. Do you just want to talk with me? It asked. You are doomed to disappear from the mortal world one way or another. It's up to you whether you choose to eliminate your obsessions and fall into reincarnation, or I'll just destroy you to ashes, Ariana stated. Eliminate my obsessions? Ha ha ha, that's easy to say. If my enemy isn't dead, my obsessions can't be eliminated. The ghost laughed menacingly. Fine, I can help you, offered Ariana. Why should I trust you? The ghost snapped, although it trusted Ariana's words to some extent. After all, if Ariana really wanted to destroy it, she would have done it by now. Do you think you have other options now? Ariana pointed out. The ghost was silent because Ariana was right. It would be defeated if they fought again, so the only way out was to compromise. What's your answer? Ariana asked. The ghost gave in. Do I have a choice? It relented. Ariana put on a satisfactory smile. Well then, tell me your story, she ordered. 
As she said that, she took out a chair from her telepathic eye space, put it on the ground, and then sat down, crossing her legs. She seemed relaxed, as if she came here not to negotiate with the ghost, but to be entertained. The ghost didn't say anything immediately, but first emerged from the water and approached Ariana. When it saw the chair appear all of a sudden from thin air, the ghost was surprised. Although it was curious about how Ariana did that, it didn't bother to ask. It was understood that she must be extremely powerful to be able to make a chair appear all of a sudden. Looking at Ariana, the ghost was still not convinced that this would end well, but since it had agreed to compromise, it naturally had to talk to her. My name is Penelope Anderson, but Anderson is actually my mother's last name. My father's last name was Wharton, for I was the illegitimate daughter of the eldest son of the powerful Wharton family. An illegitimate daughter, ha, huh? what a disgusting identity. But I never thought about joining the Wharton family. I just wanted to live my own life. However, my father's wife refused to let me go. At that time, I had a boyfriend who attended UCLA. His family was very wealthy, so he could be considered a rich second generation heir. When he first asked me out, he was so enthusiastic and serious. Although my life wasn't bad at the time and I had everything I needed, I was barely comparable to him. I thought I was Cinderella and finally met my prince, she started. He was very nice to me during the year that we were together, so I didn't know his true colors until the day I died. It turned out that he only dated me because he knew my illegitimate status. My father's wife offered him a lot of financial benefits if he agreed to get rid of me. However, I found out I was pregnant before he could think of a good way to do that. I came to the UCLA campus to see him, only to discover him kissing another girl. Obviously, he had been cheating on me for a long time. He was afraid of me making trouble, so he brought me here. We quarreled and even had a fight. He directly pushed me into the lake. I couldn't swim, and I called him for help, but he didn't save me. He told me the truth instead, that he never loved me and had planned to hurt me all along. Just like that, I drowned, along with the unformed fetus in my womb. She sighed. When Penelope finished telling her story, she burst into tears and stroked her belly, feeling extremely sad and resentful. She wished she could kill the man who wronged her, both to avenge herself and her baby. Ariana sympathized with her. If what Penelope said was true, then the man really deserved to die. An eye for an eye was Ariana's style, at least when the person killed his own relatives and friends. If a criminal killed other people, Ariana wouldn't try to kill them. Instead, she would just let the law impose justice on them. Ariana didn't have much doubt about whether Penelope's account was true or not, but it was possible that she didn't know the whole story, so Ariana had to ask for more details. What's the man's name? Ariana asked. That man's name is Casey Little, and his family's company is called Blue Maple Furnishings, Penelope answered. She gnashed her teeth when she mentioned Casey. I can only half trust your words, so I still have to investigate it by myself. If I confirm what you said, I'll give you a chance to get revenge with your own hands, Ariana explained. Upon hearing that she could get revenge, Penelope got excited and she didn't care about whether Ariana was fully convinced by her words. Revenge was what she wanted more than anything. You mean I can really get revenge myself? She asked eagerly. Yes, I have my own way to help you do it, Ariana confirmed. But now, you need to come with me. I'll put you away temporarily. When it's time to let you out, I'll let you out. Hearing that, Penelope balked. You want to put me away? She asked hesitantly. Although she was unable to fight back against Ariana's arrangement, she was still afraid that Ariana would harm her. Ariana didn't answer immediately, but stood up and picked up the chair in her hand. Then the chair disappeared in the air and was taken back into her telepathic eye space. Don't worry, I always keep my word and you have no other choices, do you? Ariana said. Fine, Penelope agreed because Ariana was right. By the way, let me ask you something. Since you died here four years ago, you should know something about the girl who died here three years ago, right? Ariana asked. Of course, Penelope replied. The girl was driven to madness by a man who harassed her. She jumped into the lake herself and gave up her life in the end. Ariana was both sad and angry to hear that. Did it happen right here? She inquired. Yes, it happened right here. Why are men so horrible? 
Don't they need to pay for their terrible deeds? Penelope lamented sorrowfully. Ariana didn't ask further about it. Regardless of whether the matter had been resolved before, she had no intention of investigating it. If that girl, like Penelope, had become a ghost, she would carry out an investigation only after she met it. After that, Ariana put Penelope into her telepathic eye space. Then it was time for her to leave. Ariana walked over to Pam, who was still unconscious, and put some magical power into her body. Pam soon woke up, but before she did, Ariana hid herself behind the trees. Pam opened her eyes, and when she remembered that she had suddenly been knocked out, she was scared to stand up immediately. After a while, she carefully got up and called out to the ghost, but there was no response. Seeing that the woman and the ghost were both gone, Pam didn't know if the ghost was destroyed by the woman or if something else had happened. Either way, she didn't dare to stay any longer, so she turned around and ran quickly on the trail that led out of the forest. Afterwards, Ariana also left. Pam ran the entire way back in a panic, causing many people to look sideways and wonder what had happened to her. She looks like she just saw a ghost, one student joked to his friend, not knowing how close to the truth his joke was. After Pam returned to her dormitory, she climbed into her bed and covered her whole body with a quilt, still trembling in fear. The other three girls in the dormitory looked at her strangely, then withdrew their gazes and continued to chat, but this time their voices were slightly lowered. After the Harper family scandal, the girls in Pam's dormitory no longer paid attention to her, and after she became gloomy, they alienated her even more. However, they still didn't dare to vent their dissatisfaction on her, nor criticize her, especially now that Pam was even more bizarre than before. If they offended her, she might harm them. Even if they wanted to criticize her, they had to do it behind her back, because none of them dared to mess with the Harper family. When Ariana returned to the dormitory, Kat and the others didn't ask where she had gone or what she had done. After all, what she did was her personal business, so they never asked too much. Ariana washed up, then went to bed. A while later, Evelyn sent another WeChat message to her, asking how the situation was, and Ariana told her the whole process.